Welcome viewers, we are the Lokonex. Today we're joined by Lord Duncan of Springbank, who's a former member of the European Parliament and currently sits in the House of Lords. Before entering politics, Lord Duncan worked as a researcher for BP's political affairs team. He was the secretary of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation and was the head of policy and communication of the Scottish Refugee Council. To add to that, Lord Duncan served as the first head of the Scottish Parliament's EU office in Brussels, with the remit of his role uh, being to manage the relationship between um, the Scottish Parliament and the institutions of the EU. In this episode, we will cover areas such as the Scottish Parliament, devolution and the European Union. So without further ado, thank you Lord Duncan for joining us. My pleasure. To off, yeah. To kick off this episode, could you explain the process of peerage and discuss your personal experience of being made a Lord? Yes, I think I can do that. Um, a peerage is a curious thing. The honour system exists in the UK in a, in a very unusual fashion. There are different types of honours which can be granted from the British Empire Medal and an MBE and so forth, the post-nominal um, honours through to knighthoods and damehoods. And there is this peculiar honour, which is a peerage. It's peculiar because it doesn't just grant the honorific of Lord or Baroness, but it also grants you an entitlement to make law, which is an unusual gift to be given by the state. The House of Lords is entirely appointed. Uh, it's full of the most extraordinary individuals I've ever come across, if I'm being honest, uh, leaders in their fields across a whole range of things, and a number of old politicians. So the combination of brilliant, great, and those who are time-served politicians is an unusual one. I got there by, I suppose, the party wanted me to stay and play. As an MEP, I was quite active. I was quite um, successful in the areas that I was working in. I was quite a... Uh, uh, an accomplished um, MEP, I believe, in the short time that I was there, which is only two and a half, two and a half, three years, I authored or co-authored more pieces of legislation than all my other MEP colleagues from Scotland added together, um, because I was diligent and I was very focused upon that. Um, when the Brexit referendum happened, I wanted to get a real job. I didn't want to hang around because the power base was going to erode. I wanted to go into the real world, and I applied for a job with the. Um, Scotch Whiskey Association. They were looking for a new chief executive because David Frost, the current uh, EU negotiator, had just stood down, as it happened. And I applied for that. And what should have been, I suspect, a, a more carefully handled uh, interview didn't happen. But the party understood from that, there was some leak that happened, that I was no longer wanted to stay active in politics. And therefore, I got a call from Ruth Davidson saying, would I consider going to the Lords? And I was still an MEP at the time. I hadn't been offered an interview for the Scotch Whiskey Association, so I thought, why not, um, if that can be made to happen? And it all looked like it was going to happen, and then something got in the way, which was the 2017 election. Um, and I had not had any great um, ambition to stand for Westminster for quite some time. So I knew I had to stand. I just wanted to be helpful to the party. So I picked the seat where I thought the chances of me winning were pretty low. I'm the Northern. The SNP majority was, um, well, over 10,000. I'd been offered other seats, and I didn't really want to do that. I wanted to stand in that because I was born in that area and raised in that area. And um, I never thought I'd win it at all. As it happened, I really didn't think I'd win that seat. And I'd made plans to go back to Brussels to carry on my work there. And I came within 21 votes of doing so. But that election was the thing that got in the way of me being ennobled earlier. Um, and it was only afterwards I thought, well, I'm done for now. There's no need to have me in the parliament. They've got plenty of uh, other people down there. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, they still wanted me, which was a, uh, uh, not unpleasant. Um, and so I became both a lord and a minister, which was um, doubly unexpected. Just on the point of um, you know, your time in politics. So I read that you're the only minister to have served in each of the UK government's territorial offices. So as many yes. will know... As many will know, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have their own devolved assemblies. So could you delve into the, what work you did in each of these offices and explain their role in our current constitutional settlement, please? Yes, I think I, I, think I surprised the people of Wales by being their minister. Uh, I don't think they were um, aware that I was their minister for a brief period. The, um, the Scotland office, if you read, there's some very good books written about the Scottish office as it then was before uh, the, the Blair government. And it was to all intents and purposes, the busiest department in government because it did everything that the UK government did in Scotland, in one department. And so it was you know, a full-on 
extraordinarily busy department. But after devolution, 90% of that work simply moved across to the Scottish government. So in lots of ways, that's an unusual department in that it still has resolved com reserved competence, but the reserved competence is usually exercised by the reserved department. So whether it be the Treasury or the Ministry of Defence or the Foreign Office or whichever one it happens to be that has the reserved power isn't usually the Scotland office. So the Scotland office at best is there for a lobbying tool primarily for Scotland to have some uh, ability to influence policies inside the UK government. Ditto for, the, for, for, for Wales. Northern Ireland is completely different. It's constituted differently. It has come to devolution by a very different route. And so I was made a Northern Ireland minister. And in truth, it consumed my time. It was 90% Northern Ireland, 10% Scotland. Uh, because Northern Ireland is, at that time had no um, government. It hadn't had a government for quite some time. It was experiencing the tensions that come from the absence of a government combined with how it got there in the first place, which were natural tensions between the different sides uh, in Northern Ireland. And there were a lot of, well, and there was Brexit thrown in just to make it all even more challenging. So in my time there, I took forward a whole range of policies into legislation from same-sex marriage in Northern Ireland. I took forward the abortion reform law. I took forward pensions for victims of the Troubles. And a lot of these pieces of legislation initiated were initiated in the Lords, not the Commons, primarily because the Commons was obsessed at that point by uh, swiveling around on the, pin of, the head of a pin about Brexit, whereas the Lords still delivered, I would argue. So my role was to try and lead on that, and it would be passed on to the Commons and bounced backwards and forwards. Um, so each is quite different. I, the one I understood least was Wales, because I, I really wasn't as active as I should have been, I suspect, in the Welsh world. Um, Scotland, I did a lot of um, travelling uh, and meeting people, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And in Northern Ireland, I made law, which was the difference. There were no laws made really in Scotland during my time in the Scotland office. There might have been some orders, but very modest ones, whereas they were fundamental bills. I took forward, I think, three Northern Ireland budgets uh, through the Lords, for example, uh, which in themselves meant you had to be a master of a whole range of detail, whereas the, the Scottish world was becalmed, even although there have been a lot of political tensions, but the political tensions never play out in the Lords, they only ever play out in the Commons. So as I alluded to in the introduction, you were the first head of the Scottish Parliament's EU office in Brussels. So that sounds like quite an interesting uh, job, but could you go into the work you did in this role and, you know, just explain, you know, what, what you had to do in the role and uh, your experience in it? Yes, that was a very clever initiative. The idea being that ultimately the, the European laws that eventually have to be implemented by the Scottish Parliament start life early in Brussels. And if you really want to influence them, you start influencing them in Brussels, not when they arrive for implementation. So the logic of it was very sound. The problem was in order to actually have that influence, you had to do a lot of work. So I was the eyes and ears of the Scottish Parliament. I would send back leaked documents that I could find, information on what was happening. I would send back bundles of information to the European Committee and to the various other committees. And the curious thing was, those committees just didn't want the information. They didn't want it because it was usually going to involve a lot of work to create the influence. So in order to be able to influence, once you've got the intelligence, you have to have a plan. What do you want to do to influence the development of fishing in the early stages in Brussels and Strasbourg. Well, that's a lot of work for somebody in um, Holyrood. Uh, and there was not a huge appetite to do that work. So I spent most of my time um, picking up all this intelligence and drafting material and shoving it back for action. But I was very rarely called upon to do anything in the other direction. And so I ended up, I would write a newsletter, which would tell people what was going on. So it was a bit like a, a sort of a, a a down at heel journalist broadly who was trying to pick up intelligence and would write it up in a, an easy to digest format and it would be read and I would then give evidence. So I, it was a bit like, again, question time where I would just answer every question on Europe that everybody had. And I did that for several years, which was quite fun. But in terms of our influence, it never lived up to what it could have been, which was if we had been smart, we could have worked with other subnational governments. We could have worked out where the, the, the benefit to Scotland would have rested. We could have been very constructive in our approach. I just don't think we ever were. And eventually, after I um, indicated I wanted to come back to Scotland, because I was thinking at that point what I was going to do next, um, they, they abolished that role in Brussels. And I did the same role, but did it from Brussels while being a clerk of the European Committee. So it, it, it didn't work because 
for it to work, you have to want to engage. And the Scottish Parliament, for all that we talk of the importance of Europe, didn't really want to get that heavily involved in actually engaging and changing the, um, the direction of policy. So we'll, we'll touch on the EU, uh, you know, afterwards. But but first, I'd like to touch on the Scottish Parliament and devolution, and you know, uh, those those areas. So with uh, Sir Keir Starmer's election as the leader of the Labour Party, with radical federalism as a key plank on his platform, the issue of increased devolution and the creation of a federal United Kingdom seems to have resurfaced in the public discourse. So what is your view on federalism and devolution in the United Kingdom, and do you think that this could curb the appetite for Scottish independence? No, no, it won't. Um, Scotland has an issue um, when it comes to federalism. If you federalised at the level of the nation state, the nation, so Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England, then you could argue, Scottish government would argue, that's a, a union of equals. But in actual fact, it isn't really a union of equals because whether you like it or not, 60 million people live in one of them and considerably fewer live in the others. So you have an asymmetry within the, the arrangement. Excuse me, the only way to genuinely federalise is to look at, for example, another subdivision of England into potentially, if you think of the, the constituencies for the European elections, there might be, what is it, 10 regions in England, all of about 5 million. So if you did that, that would be fair, because then you know, the, the 5 million people in Yorkshire, the 5 million people in the South West, their voices would be broadly equal. That works for England. They've now been able to create a different um, federal approach. But the one, the one group that doesn't want that would be Scotland. It would go from being one of four voices in theory to one of 12. Well, the influence diminishes at that point. I would argue it would be a good thing in some respects, because... The UK, like many other European nations, struggles with what's called the capital city effect. The bigger the capital city, the greater the centre of gravity, the greater the difference between the capital city and the hinterland. And that is true. So when you look at what is good for Scotland, it's usually exactly the same as what is good for the north of England or the southwest of England. It's exactly the same sort of challenges which those areas experience. The big difference is between London and everybody else. Full stop. London is just different. It's not like Edinburgh, it's not like Cardiff, it's just, it's a mega city on a global scale, it's different. Whereas, once you step outside, Scotland has more in common with Cumbria uh, and the Northwest or the Northeast or anywhere else than it would do with London. And it's that part which federalism could address, but I can't see why the Scottish government would want to make federalism work, because it would entirely undermine the ability. And it would also deprive them of the one thing which they need just now, as far as I can work out, which is someone to shout at. But at the moment you talk about Westminster as if it's bad, but in actual fact, people in the north of England think Westminster is bad. People in the south west think Westminster is really bad. They all think of that because they're all basically condemning the same thing, which is people in London not being attentive to the needs of their area. Well, that's age old, but here it's seen as a reason why there must be a break of the union, whereas everywhere else it's just seen as a fault and flaw, a flaw of the current arrangement in terms of governance. So what do you think can be done to reduce uh, you know, the capital city effect you know, do you think there are any, um, you know, any additional powers that could be transferred that would maybe deal with this, or do you think there are any other policies? Which I think the problem is that we, once you begin to start transferring powers, the question is when do you stop, um, and, and to what end? So where where shall our power best be exercised? That's the real question. So, although we talk about powers returning to Scotland, they never onward devolve anywhere else. They always rest in Edinburgh. So why is that? So if I were in the Western Isles or I were in uh, Orkney or Shetland, why would I be that bothered if powers came to Edinburgh so they could ignore us rather than London, which actually doesn't ignore them as often? So again, it's where should the power be to best exercise the needed outcome for the individual's concern, the individual communities rather than the nation of Scotland? And I think that's when you start looking at a mosaic of the land rather than as four separate bordered communities which are so different and so distinct. In actual fact, if you were trying to draw the border between differences, you wouldn't draw the border along the, the River Tweed. It wouldn't be there. It would actually be somewhere, it's not quite there anyway, but it would be somewhere completely different. It would be somewhere probably around the Wash. That's where you see the similarities. It would probably, again, be a north-south one to include Birmingham on one side and the others on the other side, because that's what the country would look like. But if you want to wrap a kilt around it and pretend that the border itself is the only thing that matters and only that border is the important thing, and we saw the dog whistling when the, the, the First Minister was talking about we may have to impose some sort of COVID um, 
quarantine at the border. And I thought, well, that's great. Although people in the Highlands could have said the same about people coming from Glasgow, presumably, because there were more people in Glasgow than there were in the island of uh, Lewis or Harris. But you didn't want to talk about internal borders at that point. You just wanted to recognize the one border that apparently, lo and behold, echoes and chimes with what you want to do politically, which to my mind is not very helpful. So just to touch on the actual legislative process, do you think there are any aspects of the Scottish legislative process which should be adopted at Westminster or vice versa? For example, the consultation process, maybe online voting uh, or any of these things? Well, they don't do online voting. That's the shocking thing. The only legislature in the UK that does fully online voting is the House of Lords. So despite the fact that there has been broadly electronic voting in the Scottish Parliament since its inception, they have not yet managed to address a technology that allows individuals who are shielding to vote from home. That was the House of Lords that did that. So why don't they adopt what the House of Lords are doing? There's a question for you. Where the Lords lead, perhaps the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament should follow. I'm more critical of the, 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 the Scottish Parliament's way of doing this because I was a clerk for a number of years. And my difficulty quite often was... In the absence of chamber, you were then dependent upon the quality of the legislation emerged at the beginning. So as long as there was, and during that, that great period, actually, when Alex Salmon was, was first minister, but he had no majority, there had to be good legislation because it had to win the support of different parties. Well, that's an important thing. But once you have a majority, you don't have to do that anymore. And then you've got to be sure that what you're doing is good and right and works. And if it does, great. And if it doesn't, not so good. So the challenge, again, for a majority government is if there's no one to hold them to account, who's to stop them doing bad things? So, so that, that's, that's an interesting point, actually. But in terms of the consultation process, do you think that, um, you know, Westminster has a better consultation process, you know, consulting businesses, you know, the public, and, you know, public bodies, or do you think the Scottish Parliament maybe uh, consults these bodies? And, uh, I think they're all, all pretty poor at consulting, I think. Um, the consultation process is broadly as good uh, as the individuals who are consulted and depending upon how active they are in addressing the issues that need to be uh, brought to the attention of the lawmakers. That's the big issue. And Scotland's a quite a small country when it comes down to that. So actually there are a limited number of players in involved. And quite often they have similar uh, perspectives, which can be interesting. So they're, they're often the diversity of opinion can be reduced challenge when you look at a country the size of the UK is you will have diversity of opinion which is perhaps stronger, more strongly taken forward. I think each can learn from each other. I suppose you can do things better and find the best model and you can try and take it forward. But I think the Scottish Parliament was a paragon when it began, but I think it's actually atrophied time. I think it has actually not become as progressive as you would expect. The first thing I would have thought during COVID, as I said, would have been electronic voting remotely. No. And yet, you know, there was no electronic voting in Westminster at all. And so from a standing start, they managed to create a system that was actually beyond where the Scottish Parliament is. And the bizarre thing is, they don't have any votes in the Scottish Parliament and haven't had since the system came in. So do, so what are your views on the current, uh, the way in which uh, voting is uh, conducted in the House of Commons? Do, do you uh, support that or would you prefer, you know, more electronic or online system? I have mixed views about that. As an MEP, I was a, I was a chief whip of my delegation, and it was my job to put together the voting scripts. So in, in um, Europe, you vote only in Strasbourg, primarily in Strasbourg, and you vote for lumps of time. So around the lunch hour, you do your voting. So it'd be up to me to marshal, which might be the number of votes that would take place could be, I'm trying not to exaggerate, between 500 and 1,000 votes. Now, what are the chances that you know what those 500 to 1,000 votes are actually about? Zero chance. Which is why, as a chief whip, I'd indicate by sticking my thumb up above my head with a thumbs up or a thumbs down or the hand like this for an abstention. And people had to watch what I was doing because we went that fast because, again, people wanted to go to their lunch. So we were voting furiously to get through the whole lot. That was electronic voting. In the lobby at Westminster, you know exactly what you're voting on because it takes bloody ages to go through that lobby. You know why you're there. You're going to be there for half an hour. You know when it's coming because it's going to be forewarned. Now, what then happens is once a vote takes place and it's a clear majority, 
Other votes which are similar to that don't take place. Why would they? Because you've already established what the majority is going to be. So you actually cancel the votes that follow thereafter. So whereas I was doing 500 to 1,000 votes, irrespective of which way they went, in Westminster, you might do one or two or three rather than the 1,000 that others might be doing. So can it be done electronically? Now it has to be done electronically. It's the only way to do it appropriately, I would argue. I wrote an article for that in the Thunder in the Times. But you need to find the balance between the two. And it's very easy to say, oh, that's absolutely dreadful, how shocking that actually is. Except when you recognise that doing a thousand votes where you know nothing at all about the issue isn't necessarily to be applauded either. Yeah, so that's an interesting point that maybe quality uh, quality of uh, you know voting is maybe more important than quantity and that people should be, or members of parliament should be educated and have the time to educate themselves and to maybe discuss with other MPs uh, about what they're voting on before actually, before actually doing well, it. What you saw during the, the height of the Brexit crises that preceded the, the 2019 general election were votes of that nature, where there weren't many of them, but my goodness, everyone knew what was happening. They knew exactly what was going to be happening in that. There was no doubt which way people had to go to vote according to what they wanted to do. There was no suggestion, as there would often be when I was doing the whipping in, in Brussels, Strasbourg, that people got the voting wrong because they just pressed the wrong button. They were pressing, and sometimes they'd be pressing the wrong button every time because they went out of sync. So every vote they did was wrong, and they had to correct it thereafter because, again, you're allowed to correct your errors, whereas, you know, less so in the House of Commons or in the House of Lords, for that matter. So that brings us on to a good, uh, a good, uh, you know, a good time to speak about the EU. So, in a 2014 interview uh, discussing the reformation of the European Union with the EU reporter, you said that change is in the air. Six years later, what do you think has changed? Bugger all. Uh, very little, I think, has changed. Um, in truth, about the way they do business, I think that's the part I, I, I struggle a bit with. I think the EU does a good job for what it is. It's blue. It's got a number of issues you can't really touch or change because they're so bedded into how things work. So it's unusual to have a, a block like the EU where 40% of its budget is still, still agriculture. So if you imagine, if I were to say to you, know, Nicola Sturgeon, should 40% of the Scottish budget be agriculture? She would say, don't be stupid. No, that would be really weird. But in the EU it is. So... So you think, well, of course, we'll change that. So Tony Blair, again, gave up part of the British rebate to secure a review of cap funding. Um, so he gave up, I can't remember what proportion it was of money, which is literally real cash the UK, in essence, had to hand back to Brussels. Did it get a real review? No, nothing changed. Not a thing. There was not, not a sausage changed as a consequence of that review at all. And again, the single biggest recipient of money that was coming through that budget was France. Because, of course, France, being one of the wealthiest nations in the world, was bound to need more money for agriculture. So, again, you, you would see these things think we would win more respect from the people if we could just find a way of perhaps addressing some of the more obvious fundamental failings of the EU. You know, we were having an argument with Mike Russell, of all people, about the common fisheries policy. And he was saying, you know, once we leave the EU, you'd have to create something similar to the common fisheries policy to manage fisheries. And I was like, no, you wouldn't. He said, no, you would. And I was like, well, during the height of the cod crisis, the cod crisis was only on one side of an invisible line in the North Sea. In the Norwegian waters, there was no cod crisis. South of that median line, there was a huge cod crisis. So common fisheries policy was the problem not the fish. Could we change that? And I thought, well, of course, it's bonkers. It's a dreadful policy. Of course we can change it. No, can't change that. They still allocate fish entitlement based upon a, a period of assessment that took place in the early 80s. That's how we allocate fish, based on something that's nearly 40 years old. That'd be like allocating fashion on based on what Duran Duran were wearing. It's like madness. Why would we do that? And yet, can't change that in the EU because the minute you start trying to change it, people get uneasy. The EU is at its worst when it gets stuck on things that are patently not very clever and it just won't change them. So just on the point of reform, uh, the United Kingdom obviously voted to leave the EU in 2016. And with Eurosceptic parties on the rise in Europe and have been for a number of years now, such as the Lega Nord in Italy and Alternative for Deutschland in Germany, what reforms do you think the EU should implement in order to become a more democratic, effective and sustainable institution? I think Brexit probably helped um, the EU in terms of its integrity, because I think... 
broadly for the, the period after the, the resignation of Cameron and, and the May years, the mess that politics in Britain experienced would be a huge antidote to anybody in any country in Europe thinking, I'll tell you what we want to do, we want to be independent. No, you don't. Not if you're going to go do the thing that Britain did. So in one sense, that has probably calmed a lot of the appetite for um, for you know withdrawal from the EU. I think that's probably helped them. I think there does need to be more fundamental change. I mean, I, I struggled with, as, a, as a, an advocate for reducing our carbon footprint, you can't have a parliament in Brussels that moves once a month down to Strasbourg. That doesn't make any sense. That, that would be weird. You're literally maintaining a full staff at the cost of hundreds of millions of euros uh, for the whole thing, you know, in France, where you basically do all your business in Brussels. And yet France always refused to allow that ever to change because that's in treaty. Actually, it's in the Treaty of Edinburgh, if that helps you, for comedy value. It was signed during the major years. Signed as part of the compromise, again, for trying to secure the opt-out for the um, social chapter the UK secured. The EU just needs to be a bit better at working out what offends people in terms of some of its old Spanish customs, some of its old particular peculiarities, and just try and work out how to do things better, because it could. It's an extraordinary entity, and it does anything at all. It's in itself an amazing thing, but it needs to do that better. The very fact that Cameron was a pro-European, and as far as I can work out, did everything he possibly could to secure modest changes from the EU, and the EU went, no, you can have these things here. And as somebody who had to go in the doorstep and explain, and there were five things he got, I got stuck after three. I could never get to the fourth. I was like, what's the fourth one again? If the EU had been a little bit more attentive to some of that, there could have been you know, a stronger sense of the UK remaining inside the EU within a reformed package and so on. But it never happened. And we're left with this curiosity where the EU, which I care passionately about, and I, I, I thought I'd spend the rest of my career there, um, you know, lo and behold, here we are, and you have to make the best of where you end up. But um, the EU is still a force for good. It's just needing a bit more kind of reform, and it's been needing it for some time. But I'm just not sure where it's going to come from. So you said that the EU needs reform and you're not sure where it's going to come from. Do you think that it will reform? Do you, do you have an optimistic view of, um, of the EU over the next you know, century or decades or you know, over the next few years? Do you think that the EU can change and will change or will it stay in a sort of similar situation that it is now? I'm not sure what it can do to change. Hmm. Normally you would argue a charismatic leader carrying all in his wake will be able to bring about extraordinary changes. But what would that be? So if I look at the situation now, that the, the, the currency question I think has caused huge issue for the EU. Uh, it certainly has depressed and become the, the Mediterranean zone. They are definitely a bad place. Um, they are struggling now to try and achieve any economic growth. Germany seems unwilling to adjust its fiscal approach, so that's not ideal. The new package which has come out to, in essence, create euro bonds is, is a big step forward, but, but it broadly just cements the German hegemony of the situation, as far as I can see, because the empowerment then is you're going to be taking even more money as these nations, which means you are now wholly dependent upon the entity that is the EU. The ability for you to do things different will be zero. And then the question will be at what point they begin to erode further the particular things that make you different. So Ireland won a very important case regarding the Apple question, the, um, the tax question. But that's been a bugbear of the EU for as long as I've been involved. They always wanted to stop Apple having this very reduced um, level of taxation because it felt it was getting a benefit, which technically it does. It attracts more people in because it's got a low tax, a low corporate tax, corporation tax. But will the EU try and change that? Ultimately, I suppose it will, because why does it want Ireland to get all the benefit? So I can't see how the change will come. Because I don't think it's enough to just bolt on a bit more around the back. It needs to be fundamental reform from the centre of how it works. And I, I'm just not seeing that. And some of that reform would therefore be ceding of power, I would argue, from the nation state into the, the, into the, um, the centre in Brussels. But no nation state wants more power. So what is it seeding? It becomes a difficult thing to try and work out what the end game would be. Political union would be ultimately the, the, the aim where you ended up with a, a parliament and, a, and an executive, you know, one born of the other. But which nation state wants to give up its um, commissioner in order to have that person drawn from the European parliament? 
So you've, you 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 said that you're you know pro European, but you've you know painted the EU in quite a negative light. So you know what do you think the benefits are of remaining in the EU, and why 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 are you pro pro EU if you've got such a cynical <laughs> view of it from the inside? I'm cynical about it. I see problems and I want solutions. And I won't try and paper over them because apparently being in the EU is marvellous. I want those things changed. It's not enough to say, oh, well, that might be dreadful. You know, the common fisheries policy might be awful, but it's the price worth paying to stay inside the EU. No, reform the common fisheries policy and make it work. That's what we should be doing. We shouldn't be spending 40% of the EU budget on agriculture in the fashion that we do. That needs to be reformed. Let's make it work. But what we instead do is, say, isn't the EU marvellous? You think, okay. Um, are we planning any reform to, to, to address these clear deficiencies? No, no, because it's marvellous. It's mar 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 we don't need to reform those. It's, it's great. We, need, we need to have Brussels and Strasbourg, because that's marvellous. That's a really clever and smart way of doing business. If we're not even going to be willing to address it, no, it's too late for the UK right now in this cycle. It's not coming back in anytime soon. It's not going to have the leverage to change that. And frankly, I'm not even sure an independent Scotland will be whistled in at the speed it thinks it will be coming either primarily because certain member states don't want the, the good model that Scotland would represent to Catalonia or to Lombardy or wherever it happens to be. The EU as a single market is an extraordinary thing. But again, the people who pushed for that, that would be the UK. The person who did the most to establish a single market was probably Margaret Thatcher, of all people. Um, and a lot of that was about taking away the barriers to trade, taking away the, the established practices which stopped things being uh, open and available. And one of the bigger issues we see coming through again and again is some nation states wishing to revert back to further protectionism, further limits, further controls, further things that stop that freedom of movement. And it becomes challenging, uh, I think, when you start looking at the EU, because every member state basically blames the EU when it wants to. It just does. The EU is awful when it wants to be awful, um, despite the fact it's part of the EU. You're awful then, aren't you? UK or France or Germany, it's your fault, you're in it. Why didn't you make it better? It's not the EU's fault for being bad. You didn't manage to win the arguments among enough allies inside the membership to change it. So I suppose it is quite a sad thing to look at where the EU is going to be because for all those who say we must rejoin or isn't the EU marvelous, we're, we're missing the point which is the EU itself needs to reform. And I'm not seeing a great deal of talk about that anymore. When I joined in 2014, Everyone was talking about how is it going to reform? It can't go on like this. We need to look at the budget and try and work out how to make these things happen in a different way. I'm not hearing any of that anymore. It's all stopped. It's almost as if Brexit has meant that you just have to basically say the EU is great because it does all these great things um, and that doesn't need to be reformed anymore. It's good enough. Well, not really. So what do you think are the maybe constitutional and legislative benefits of leaving the EU? Um, well, I suppose if you were to go back, I was just doing a, um, a webinar with Hilary Benn, and I'm thinking of his father, Tony Benn, and his comments, and his big one was always, um, you can fire uh, the government of the UK, but you can't fire the commission. And I suppose you could argue that it's true. Um, you can change fundamentally the direction a government is taking in the UK at the polls. You really can't fundamentally change the direction that the EU is taking because it's a different beast and it's hard to do. So although you know, countless people have spoken about the importance of changing the common fisheries policy, it didn't change. And although Tony Blair, probably one of the most popular politicians at the time in Europe, you know, recognising the problem that the common agricultural policy represented both you know, visually and in terms of, of how it worked, he couldn't bring about any change in that. So there's no doubt the ability to, to boot people out you don't like, and I say that as an unelected lord, so I'm aware of the irony, but the ability to throw people out who are not to your liking and vote in someone you want to change the policy is, is a fundamentally good thing. The challenge will be how the EU and the UK then determine its new life together. And it will be, you know, had the UK not joined the EU, had it done what Norway did back in the 70s and decided for whatever reason it wasn't joining, we would be the most important nation for the EU to have um, brokered a deal with. Because we're the single biggest economy in proximity to the EU. You know, for all you talk about the EU's relationship with Colombia and its free trade deal with South Korea and how important it is to reach out, the most important nation to get a free trade deal with would be the UK, just full stop. So it's incumbent on the EU to recognise that for what it is, which is a net benefit to them if a deal can be struck, as it is for the UK. 
And there's no doubt, again, if we can get that right, both can benefit, just in a different way. Yeah, so on the point of, uh, you know, legislation, uh, etc. Do you, do you feel that the direct uh, effect of EU law is too overbearing on its independent uh, jurisdictions? No, not especially. Um, I think there are several problems with EU law. I think one, the time it takes to make it, and, and this is a, a broadly through the, the courts, it's a really lengthy process to adjudicate because you now have so much law coming from consideration. To, I think that's a real problem and I think the, the European Court of Justice is just not resourced enough to be able to deal with this change. Um, I think striking down laws which have passed through um, a legislature is a challenge. So legislature should be paramount, the legislature is the people. It shouldn't be incumbent upon judges to interpret what they believe to be what should be over what actually has been voted on. Now that can be abused. A legislature can get things wrong, there's no doubt about it. But I think when you look at the voting rights question of prisoners, you know, the, the UK Parliament and the Scottish Parliament both said a prisoner should not be entitled to vote. And the European Court struck that down. And neither have really addressed, I mean, the Scottish Parliament's moving in that direction more now. But in lots of ways, a legislature making its opinion clearly known, there has to be some recognition that a legislature's job is to make the law and the job of a court, as long as that law is constitutionally sound. The job of the court is to interpret it, not to decide that actually, irrespective of what the legislature wants, are not having it. And, you know, actually, I think Italy deprives its um, prisoners of a vote, just does so in a, a different way. So there are different ways of achieving the same ends. You could argue, I mean, the UK has been very good at taking on board these decisions and adjusting its law. It really has. And actually, the UK courts are also very good at drawing precedent, not just from Europe, but also from around the world, where good law is made, European courts will often use it. So the Canadian uh, precedents can be drawn in as an example of a good law. So the UK courts can still be doing that going forward, I suppose. Um, but I do think there's been some, the tree of law has grown, I think, in a way that was not anticipated. And a lot of the interpretations, I think, are unfortunate. The one that was affecting me, the notion that um, marriage needed to be between a man and a woman versus, I mean, I'm married to a man, so I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a great supporter of that interpretation. But that didn't pass muster with the European court. They, wouldn't, they didn't adjudicate on that at all. So what I think is an inalienable right to marry the person I love in the legal framework that I enjoy, the European court didn't get involved in that. So but, you have to work out, maybe that's an area where they could have done, but they didn't want to upset the cultural balances that are represented inside the laws of the various states of the EU. So not ideal, not always quite the paragon you'd want it to be. We've come to the end of the discussion and it's been an interesting conversation. So thank you very much and uh, we'll just end it there. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Rami.